Okay, people, we are continuing. Um, yeah, we just heard like a very interesting talk about modular blockchains. And now we are continuing with another very important and cutting edge um, topic, which are zero knowledge proofs. And therefore, I have uh, Jan Lauinger from the TUM. He's uh, doing his PhD at the moment. And he will talk about uh, ZK one on one, the, the magic of proving without a reeling. So, a big round of applause for Jan. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, let me quickly check if the slides are working and if I can control them. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, I will try to keep this talk um, rather on the high level and uh, try to explain some of the core building blocks that lead to these constructions of proof systems initially. And then I will, in a, in a second phase of the talk, I will also then go towards the implementation side, towards applications that are uh, currently being proven using uh, ZK technology. So let's uh, just start right, right into the topic. So zero knowledge proofs um, are um, yeah, cryptographic proof systems. And uh, typically, there is a two-party setting where you have a prover and a verifier. And so the idea is that the prover should convince the verifier of a certain statement. And so now we take um, just an example of Alibaba's cave. So here we have um, the verifier in, in red and the prover in, in yellow. And the statement that has been proven is, I know um, a key that opens the back door in this cave. And um, also what we also want to do is we don't want to reveal this key to the verifier. So the idea is that the prover proves this fact that he owns or knows a key that opens the back door in the cave and the verifier learns nothing beyond this statement. So it does not learn the key, but it learns that the key can open the back door in this cave. And so how do we do this? So we have the prover um, entering this cave and then the prover randomly selects uh, one path, so either path A or path B, and then goes into the cave. And then at uh, and in the next phase, the verifier uh, calls out um, calls out the prover via some uh, via some via some random via some random selection of the path so in this case uh, the verifier calls please appear at path b and then the prover appears at path b and so now the verifier thinks okay maybe maybe the prover was lucky and committed initially to path b and then i called him out at path b so um, maybe he was just lucky and that does not really convince me so you what you want to do is you want to um, um, perform this whole experiment, experiment multiple, multiple times, so multiple epochs, and then eventually um, the chances of cheating become very low, and then the verifier is convinced. Because, uh, yeah, just if you run this over and over again, and, uh, and the prover always uh, selects a different path and then has to appear at some, some other path, then this makes the, the chances of always predicting the choice of the verifier really difficult for the prover. So at some point, the prover must know uh, this, uh, this secret key to the back door to, to appear at the, at the right path. So that's the main, main core principle behind these proof systems. And so now what we do is, um, in, in, yeah, in, in <laughs> computer te technology, so we need numbers to, to represent this whole principle. Um, and so you typically have to fall back on math um, and then you just um, do this sort of same idea and translate it into a ma mathematical representation. And so now let's start off uh, very simple. So this is a very simple proof protocol now, which proves the discrete log of, a, um, um, of a, that which proves the discrete log computation uh, in a cryptographic group. So here, the statement is um, represent a statement that the prover is proving is represented by this u to the power of alpha, which is a group value. And so what is this statement? Now, this statement is actually an encryption. So it's a one-way function. It's easy to compute, but really difficult to invert. And so by sharing this, by sharing this uh, parameter a, the verifier cannot actually find what uh, alpha is. And so now 
The idea is now we want to run this proof protocol and then in the end the verifier should be convinced that the prover knows this alpha parameter, but um, the verifier should not learn this parameter. So that's now a very uh, specific statement, but typically in these zero knowledge proof statements that you prove, you have so some form of protection on the values that you're trying to prove. In this case, it's this uh, weird exponentiation function. Uh, this is just a security measure, and this is something that we want to prove. And now, how does a proof system work? In, in, in theory, you have to prove several properties on the proof system uh, that then ensure that this, this whole uh, paradigm operates correctly. And so what you do is you have to uh, show completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. These are three properties, and I'm going now through how these three properties can be constructed on the example above um, that we have here. And then this is now a dedicated proof system that can only, um, that can only prove um, this exponentiation function. But what we actually want to have is we want to perform arbitrary proofs on, on whatever data we have. And for this, we need um, then better constructions of proof systems. And this will be then explained in the next step before we then go to the, to the applications. So let's start. How does this work? So um, the first thing that you have to show is completeness. This just means an, an honest um, prover is able to convince an honest verifier. And this means that there has to um, exist a computation trace that sort of uh, lets, the, lets the verifier um, become convinced of knowledge of this, of this alpha value. And so, and so how do we do this? So typically, in a, this is now an interactive uh, proof protocol. Here, the, the idea is that the prover, first of all, commits. It's, an, it's also an, just an encryption of a random value r and shares this commitment to the verifier. Then the verifier, similar to, to um, it happened in the, in the cave example, randomly selects this parameter c. It's just a random choice. And then afterwards, the prover shares um, this linear equation. It, it computes c times alpha plus random r. And so the thing is, if you have this capital R value at the verifier, then the verifier cannot know this uh, uh, small r. Same here, uh, if you receive the capital A value, then, can, then you cannot um, get to the alpha value. And uh, the prover, however, knows all these parameters, and he can now compute this function right here and then share z. The value z can be shared because um, this uh, random value small r right here blinds sort of what the actually alpha value is because c is known to the verifier. And so if, if the prover would just share alpha, then uh, obviously, or, or c times alpha, then the, the verifier would be able to just uh, uh, divide this, uh, divide z by z by c and then get alpha. So we just want to share this other, or we want to compute the other randomness on top of it. It's a one-time pad encryption. It's also an encryption function. You can think of it as another encryption function. And then you can safely uh, share z over. And then if the verifier computes uh, u to, this, to the power of z and then this, this other part of the equation, then this uh, sort of uh, equals out. Uh, and the, the verifier knows, ah, OK. Well, if, if the prover was able to compute the z value that matches all these parameters right here, then he must have access to the alpha value and to the, to the r value. Otherwise, this, uh, this um, computation of the z value would not have been possible. And so this allows the verifier to check the correctness of this uh, statement without getting access to the secret parameter. So that's completeness. However, what the, what the prover can do, it can actually, so the prover sh should, uh, could be able to cheat and convince the verifier of, a, of an untrue fact. And this is what soundness prevents. So soundness is, a, is another uh, concept where, where actually soundness ensures that the proof system actually, where the, where the proof system must use a correct um, secret in order to convince the, convince the verifier. And so how, how is this ensured? So the verifier needs a way to check whether the actual secret um, exists and, and makes sense, sort of. Otherwise, um, it could um, convince the verifier of a, uh, the prover could convince the verifier of an, of an arbitrary effect. And so how is this done? Soundness is typically shown um, via some impossible um, assumption. So what you, what you do is what you do is that you don't do in reality is you give the verifier um, two 
um, instances of this protocol that the verifier uh, runs uh, after each other and sort of receives two transcripts um, where the prover uses the same values. And this is usually not possible in, in reality because every time the prover also participates in the protocol, it should, it should use uh, a different randomness and so on and so forth. So we just use these two instances. This is now a theoretical thing that we do. And then uh, by obtaining actually these transcripts twice and uh, the verifier selects a different uh, C prime, um, another choice, then the verifier is able to um, solve the whole equation right here uh, towards alpha and then see if this alpha value exists or if some garbage or some impossibility thing comes out. But if this exists, then soundness is guaranteed by the proof system. And so the next thing is, um, towards the zero knowledge property now, is the verifier should not learn anything uh, on, this, on this alpha parameter. And so what you do is, you have, a, you have another paradigm in computer security, which is uh, this simulation pi paradigm, simulation paradigm. So here the idea is that you have an ideal um, operation of this whole protocol and this whole transcript, and you have a real um, execution of the protocol. And then you compare these two executions of the protocol, and this should be um, indistinguishable, so the, the verifier should not be able to distinguish anything and learn anything from, from these two executions. And um, also what the verifier should have is the verifier should have access uh, like to all the to all the parameters that are being uh, generated in this in this in this protocol um, and so the idea is that uh, so if the verifier actually um, cannot distinguish the real execution from an ideal one then the verifier does not actually know something that you would not have learned beforehand so that's sort of the idea um, um, and that you need to to show the uh, to show the zero knowledge property. And usually, um, when you construct this, then the simulation paradigm only gives you honest verifier zero knowledge. So this means honest verifier zero knowledge means the verifier does not learn anything. However, the verifier also behaves honestly, which is not typically the case in reality. And because in reality, we always have to assume malicious acting, uh, maliciously acting uh, verifier and also prover. And so, uh, yeah, we, we apply this, if we apply the simulation paradigm, run two instances of this uh, transcript and show that uh, uh, sort of these two transcripts, the simulated transcript and the real transcript are indistinguishable, then we, re we receive honest verifier zero knowledge. Uh, why honest verifier knowledge? Because the verifier still has this, uh, this uh, power to determine the value C in this protocol, and so it could use this C and, and sort of use it to predict some outcome of this function right here. So it could pick Z as, uh, yeah, actually as it's not allowed as zero or to some, some other number, and then try to, to learn anything from the choice of C that should be prevented to actually get the real zero knowledge notion. And how this can be achieved, the real zero knowledge uh, notion, is you use a Fiat-Shamir uh, heuristic, a Fiat-Shamir transform that's typically used where you actually replace this choice uh, of C uh, at the verifier with a hash function that is being computed at the prover. And so the verifier has no choice of, of um, like predicting or, or, or playing some sort of extraction game uh, that gives access to some secret information. And so, yeah, with this, with this transform, you can then achieve a non-interactive protocol because all the things can be then computed by the prover shared with the verifier. The verifier is then able to verify this, this whole thing. So this is how, how these three notions work. And these three notions can be found in any proof system that you, that you, uh, that you use. So always make sure to, to, if you get access to a proof system, check out how uh, completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge is constructed. Try to understand that. Um, and now I want to go to... Uh, to um, the construction of general purpose proof systems. So um, before that, we had the, the um, before that we proved the fact that we know um, uh, the, the discrete log um, for a group uh, group parameter, but we want to actually prove that we, for example, know the pre-image of a hash function, or we know some input that leads to some encrypted output. Um, and how do we do that? We need more powerful proof systems to do that. And uh, here I just want to show you the main building blocks that you have to investigate and have to compose together in order to obtain a more powerful proof system. And this is a very large design space because all these 
uh, building blocks exist in different notions, so it's a yeah, challenge to know everything, but like system, systematizing this, these, these, uh, this space is also, I think, still an open thing to do, so that would be a great contribution to research, I think. And let's dive into these building blocks. Now, instead of, um, now instead of um, just this mathematical um, exponentiation function, we want to um, now go to arbitrary functions. These arbitrary functions are typically expressed via these um, uh, arithmetic representations. So this is a gate-based uh, representation of a circuit. Uh, and this circuit can implement whatever functionality now. And so the idea here is that you have this, uh, have the circuit first of all. You have an arithmetic representation, uh, and you can, th and this one also satisfies uh, some some secret. So here we now speak of the proven fact as a witness. So this is now the the secret witness that the prover has, and it wants to convince uh, the verifier of an arbitrary circuit that successfully evaluates this this witness right here. And so now what we need to do is. We need to transform this whole arithmetic representation into um, a mathematical um, into a mathematical representation that we can then commit to. Because if I quickly go back to to this slide right here, here we had um, the commitment to the randomness parameter, uh, and then this randomness was used in in order to compute z. And we need again the same thing. Here we have not uh, this alpha right here, but we have an arbitrary circuit. Uh, we need somehow to commit to uh, this circuit representation in some way in order to encode the whole computation circuit now into this into this proof system. And so what you typically do is you go from this arithmetic representation. Here you have the rank one constraint system, R1 CS is probably the most easy thing. And then you want to um, put this over into a, into a quadratic arithmetic program which is nothing um, else but a system of equations over polynomials. So think of it as the, R, uh, the, the R1CS system as a matrix that uh, represents all the, the, circuit, the circuit equations in, in form of a matrix. And then you want to actually use some polynomials now to uh, sort of uh, encode this matrix. Think of it as you have the solution and you want to come up with a polynomial representation of your computation. Uh, and, and this is sort of the, the counterintuitive thing which we did back then in math in school when we had usually a polynomial function where we did not know what, what, what's inside of the x values and we had to solve it for uh, determining x. And this now is the, the sort of other way around. Here you have the parameterization first and you now want to come up with a polynomial because a polynomial can then be used and you can then find some secret knowledge of this polynomial that only the prover knows, that is sort of, sort of that corresponds to the problem that you have in the arithmetic circuit, and that can then be proven via the proof system. So that's the main idea. And um, when you do this uh, quadratic arithmetic program, then you also have to find uh, uh, some some way that you can then use commitment schemes uh, to commit to these polynomials, and then you also need a way to uh, now give the verifier some access, as we saw initially in the interactive protocol, um, because the verifier needs some, some powers to uh, query the knowledge of uh, the prover in order to be convinced. And so this whole paradigm is represented by an, a so-called interactive oracle proof, an IOP. And there are also multiple versions of these, of these IOPs. Uh, but this is an information theoretic object. You have the cryptographic uh, you have the correct cryptographic commitment building block and then these, these other building blocks. And with those building blocks, you can now do the same thing as before. So we again have, have this um, concept of a prover and a verifier. And so now the idea is that instead of uh, committing to just uh, randomness, you commit to polynomials or to more powerful mathematical uh, represent objects, then the verifier still has some uh, some some powers, so it, it can query, please give me uh, the, the function you committed, uh, the function you committed me to me beforehand, and please evaluate this function at a specific point. So you can, the verifier can then, for example, um, perform some zero tests. So does this uh, polynomial that you committed to evaluate zero at a specific random point? So these kind of uh, queries are performed at the verifier, and also the 
The idea is that not all the polynomials that are shared or committed to are evaluated on every point. Instead, you try to reduce the selection of, of uh, points that you want to query to a minimum because this uh, optimizes the efficiency of the proof system. And then, um, so yeah, so uh, for example, the verifier selects multiple random, random choices, um, hands this over to the prover. The prover then evaluates the committed polynomials over certain choices of parameters. And then in the end, the verifier performs a similar check and then knows, okay, uh, the specific statement uh, was proven successfully or, or uh, not successfully by the, by the prover. So that's the idea of how you uh, compose these, these systems. And so, um, yeah, let me go, let me go to, to some other uh, aspects now of these proof systems. So uh, first of all, you have multiple ways of, of uh, committing, uh, of commitment schemes, and these commitment schemes must match to the, to the structures that you're using. So there are polynomial, multilinear, vector commitments, and so on. Uh, or um, in a product commitments, there are multiple choices. Um, you always have to investigate what applies here. So what is the research paper that you're reading and doing with regards to the polynomial commitment? And then what kind of IOP is used? And so an IOP can be classified on the, on the access um, and the powers of the verifier. So if the verifier can query the, the messages of the prover, then it has oracle access. If the verifier behaves probabilistic and makes some random choices in this process, then randomness applies. Does there exist interaction? Uh, are there multiple provers and so on? So there are there many ways actually how IOPs uh, uh, can, be, can be classified. And so I just wanna give you the idea that there exists multiple choices uh, and you have to actually now then read into all of them to fully understand them. And this then defines how powerful the verifier behaves and can perform queries. Um, yeah. Um, so far, so good. Let's uh, let's quickly um, uh, speak of the point of how these things are constructed in in practice. So there are these uh, mathematical um, operations that you can do in cryptography. So there are these security functions. So you have bilinear groups that can be used to commit. You have hash functions that can be used to commit uh, elliptic curves and, and so on. So these are things that are then used to implement actually the commitment scheme. Um, and this is then really the, the low level things that you find if you dive into code. But this is also something that you need. And so don't mix up uh, all the other sort of building blocks with then the mathematical constructions, because uh, there can be multiple ones uh, that do the same thing sort of, however, uh, you just use uh, different other uh, mathematical uh, constructions to do the same thing. Um, then I want to quickly speak of um, the types of proof systems that exist today. Uh, so unfortunately, this slide doesn't cover the last point, I'll, I'll mention it. So what we have today is what I've showed you in the beginning was just um, the, the um, arguments of knowledge system, which was interactive in the beginning. And if we want to have a non-interactive argument of knowledge system, then uh, we have to apply fiat Shamir, get the zero knowledge property. Uh, and this is almost the first uh, term snark. Um, but, and then the S means you have succinctness. Addi in, in addition to that, this means you have very short proofs and it's very fast to verify. So if you add succinctness to the initial example I've showed you in the first place, then you get snarks. And they have this sort of compression feature because they, uh, where you, you, you compute a proof and then it's, it's very cheap to verify this whole computation that has been proven. Um, and the next thing, the next type is usually in a, in a SNARK you have uh, a trusted setup. This is, uh, this is uh, something that uh, is defined via the, typically via the commitment scheme and then over the commitment scheme via the, the mathematical um, 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 parameters that you use. So maybe, sorry, let's stay here. Uh, so, so a trusted setup means um, in this whole, um, in this whole um, protocol, there must be a, another independent third party that is uh, encrypting a bunch of random um, initialization vectors and then is assumed to delete uh, these, this randomness afterwards. And so, um, yeah, you can think of if the, if the, so if the, <laughs> if the trusted person that performs the setup does not behave, then it would have access to the randomness and could, could compromise the, the system. And so in SNARKs, you typically find this, uh, this, uh, this problem that they have uh, a trusted setup, 
And so what Starks then do, the next thing is they have a transparent setup. Uh, this means, um, yeah, you can just run them uh, between the prover and the verifier and there's no extra party. So this is really cool. That's what, what you want to have. However, constructing transparent snarks is more difficult because you need other paradigms. You, you typically use then, use then hash-based uh, commitments, functional commitments, and then you, you uh, can, can get the construction of Starks. Um, then there's, uh, and, then, and then also why, why exist MPC-based uh, zero-knowledge proof systems. So this is another notion because usually if you, if you compute a ZK snark or a function in a ZK snark circuit, then they are efficient if the computation logic also um, is in the same, happens in the same math domain that you are using for building the proof systems. And, and these are typically algebraic structures. And the problem is that hash functions that we typically have in, in TLS or in the internet today, they are non-algebraic in, in their nature. And now there are new hash functions coming up with algebraic nature, such as MIMC. They are easy to compute in, in ZK circuits. However, it's difficult to evaluate uh, non-algebraic structures efficiently. And that's where multi-party computation um, um, sort of comes in, because multi-party computation is able to to compute um, non-algebraic uh, algorithms really efficiently. And um, the interesting thing is if you think about um, multi-party computation, uh, or let's, let's just uh, go to uh, two-party computation, which is a subset of, uh, of multi-party computation. Let's assume we have two parties. Multi-party computation, what it does is it allows these two parties to evaluate a public function where the inputs of the two parties remain private. And a zero-knowledge protocol is very similar. It also has two parties, but only one, uh, one party has private inputs. So, uh, so actually, zero-knowledge proof systems is a subset of, of two-party computation, if you think of it um, in, a, in this theoretical way. So it's really interesting, and this means if you just use uh, two-party multi-party computation, then um, and you only uh, use one party that provides the private inputs, then you're actually having a sort of the zero knowledge proof system. And then there are multiple paradigms, interactive, interactive, interactive paradigms that allow you to construct a maliciously secure, um, uh, secure um, multi-party computation. Uh, so there's, yeah, there are the multi, multi garbled circuit based MPC, multiple notions MPC that you can look up, but you can also use MPC to construct uh, proof systems, interestingly. And um, like if you have these uh, non-algebraic statements that you need to prove, then go to those. Or if you have a mix of all that, then you probably want to switch between, uh, between uh, proof systems that handle certain um, algebraic things efficiently and then compute some other things and some other proof systems maybe and even combine this or get this together. And now going to recursive, the, the recursive uh, proofs, this means that you can compute a proof of a proof uh, this is typically done in um, in um, roll-ups in, in blockchains, where you, where multiple uh, clients send proofs to an to an uh, intermediary that then uh, uh, computes this recursive proof, which then can be efficiently verified at uh, some constrained uh, blockchain, resource-constrained blockchain, and then uh, you can yeah you can efficiently verify lots of lots of computation quickly. And then there is also the, the concept of zero knowledge EVMs that is currently explored, where EVMs means you have like uh, this, this entire compute engine where you can throw in arbitrary computations so you get out the result. And typically, if you have a snark based framework or you know, whatever other framework, then you have to specify the circuit and you have to specify how are these integers now being translated into strings, how, how are numbers being translated, uh, how does the input and outputs then can be compared and asserted. Um, the idea is that ZK EVMs just handle everything for you. They, they pick the right efficient uh, proof system and, and perform um, some other arguments to optimize the, the computation and so on and then do just everything for you. Uh, this is another domain that has been currently investigated. Yeah, so far to, to these things. And, and now uh, what can we do with the whole uh, stack of proof systems that we have today. So we can, we can, we can get confidentiality because of this input privacy feature uh, at the prover. We can do compression if we use uh, SNARKs, the succinctness property, 
or we can also use these to, to get some, some sense of credibility. And I just want to mention now uh, uh, some, some application domains and privacy. You have credentials, that's a prominent one, where the idea is that you do not disclose uh, your, your data, but instead you, sh you just tell, tell the other party, well, I am of a certain age that is below or above a certain threshold. So let's say you're above 18, but you don't want to reveal how old you are. And then this would be uh, in, a, in a credential. Then you have group membership. You want to show I'm part of a specific group, but I don't want to reveal who I'm actually are uh, of this group. Then you could use uh, ZKP technology as well. Then for cr compression, I've mentioned roll-ups. You have to look up ro lo roll-ups, what they are. They, um, they solve a scalability issue of, of blockchain applications. Or you can also use um, um, ZKP snarks in this case to to get an even more uh, compact uh, verification of multiple credentials. Um, then there is this whole domain of content provenance that is becoming more and more popular, uh, which allows you to show if you have, so, so currently the internet is protected by secure channels. Every time we communicate over the internet, it's protected because uh, secure communication is enforced um, by also states. And the thing is, usually you cannot witness the communication that goes on. Uh, as an external party, um, so if some if some client interacts with his his banking his banking uh, service, then you don't know what kind of values uh, they are they are communicating, which is good. However, if the client wants to uh, wants to uh, convince you that he no owns a certain balance, um, then content provenance is is important. Content provenance means uh, like the the provenance of of data is. Where does data originate from? And maybe uh, sometimes you want to show that some data originated from a secure channel. And um, in this case, ZKP technology can be used where you just show, well, here are some parameters that are linked to this uh, secure communication session, which I had with this respective party. And if I perform now the whole data protection, the encryption algorithm in the ZK circuit and show that the data that I've encrypted complies with a certain statement, then you can show uh, that the actual data originates from this, uh, uh, from this uh, channel and complies with a specific statement. Um, so that's what you can do. You can, uh, yeah, co image compression should go one up, <laughs> which I have here. And then you use this uh, to, to also secure data feeds uh, from the web two to the web three part. So to the isolated smart contracts, or you prove some, some facts from the, from the blockchain world to some other service. And then there are these blockchain specific applications such as tor Tornado Cash, which is an anonymity mixer um, where you can get um, anonymized funds to, to, some, to some address uh, and, you, and nobody knows who this address belongs to. Um, or you can actually make um, uh, payments secure, fully secure, fully private, uh, because typically if you have blockchains, then, uh, then everybody sees your transactions. If you're using banks, then only your banking provider can track all your payments because they get their notification if you pay somewhere. Um, and then there is Zcash, which is fully private. Um, yeah, and then let's continue. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are many, many different applications of this group membership, uh, group membership, uh, CKP technology. Uh, I just uh, want to show them quickly here. So there, there is this concept of nullifiers um, and there are, there are other membership proofs. So this is a field that has multiple applications. So it's also really interesting, but I want to quickly go to, to, to uh, the implementation side of things and show you uh, what you have to do if you actually now, either need to build uh, one of these proofs or if, if some, some of the systems that you interact with use this technology, then what you typically need to do is you always have to go down to the, to the ZK, ZK circuit, to the circuit and figure out what it's doing. So usually you have some private parts of this, of this secret witness and there's also a public part of this witness. And you can think of the public part as just the, the values that can be just disclosed in the statement. So let's say you have um, an encryption f output uh, where you can learn nothing from and you know a parameter that is uh, um, like hidden by this, by, this, um, by this function and you want to show that the parameter um, under your encrypted value 
matches a certain statement, then you would typically um, put the encryption the encryption output here as the as the public as the public input at the bottom, and the secret parameters would be the private input. And then this circuit, what it does is it now takes all these inputs, combines them, performs some assertion, so it checks if you compute now this encryption function on your private input, does it match the, the public outputs uh, that you also have. And this is typically what this proof that does. And, and in a proof system, whenever a proof system is used, just go to the ZK circuit, figure out what it does, and then you quickly understand what the application is actually doing. And then um, I want to go to the to the um, yeah to the to the developers quickly and just show you currently um, like if you would be able to, so if you need to implement dedicated proofs and there I've shown you in the beginning there are all these parameters and then you have to actually represent all these parameters in code but however there is this powerful frameworks which abstract away all the all the complexities and you just interact with three things in the in the end which are represented at the bottom. So you typically have a setup function. If you have a proof system that requires a trusted setup, the setup function typically gives you a prover key and a verifier key, which is denoted at the bottom, and you compile your circuit via this setup function. And then you have uh, the witness management, so you need to translate your uh, private and public inputs to a representation, representation that is um, that can be taken by the proof system. And then you have two algorithms typically, or two function calls. It's a proof function call and a verify function call. And this proof function call should be called at the prover, and the verify function call should be verified um, at the verifier typically. So this means every time you compute or run this setup algorithm, then you need to serialize the prover and verifier key sent this over the wire to the respective parties to be able to then call the proof function at the prover and a verify function at the verifier. Uh, same goes for the witness. If you have the witness, the private parts should be kept private at the uh, prover, and the public witness uh, can be um, sent uh, without protection over, over the internet, because it's anyways public, uh, but needs to be at the, at the verifier, and then the verifier can, can verify the proof. The proof function output is just now pi, the sort of proof byte string that you have to send to the verifier who can then run the verifier. And this is how you typically um, interact if you are implementing proofs these days. There is Circum, it's a popular general purpose proof system that you probably heard of, or GNARK, a Go-based one. Um, and yeah, they allow you to interact with these abstractions to uh, quickly put these things together. So you just need to find a circuit that you want or construct the circuit yourself mm -hmm. and then run these algorithms. Yeah, and then I just want to quickly link to uh, one of the, I don't know how it, how it works with the slide sharing. I, I assume that you get access to the slides somehow. Um, I also have another repository that shows you how to actually perform all the things in a general purpose proof system um, and also does a verification of proofs at a solidity at the Ethereum-based uh, virtual machine at blockchains. Uh, there you also want to use SNARKs with efficient verification because uh, in, in a blockchain context, if you verify something on-chain, then you want to make sure that this is cheap. Um, so this is an interesting application error for SNARKs. Um, yeah, and then um, I provide some other useful resources for you. You can look up how these proof of knowledge are constructed, this Schnorr proof of discrete log that I showed you, uh, how to construct general purpose proof systems from scratch. There you can actually find implementations of polynomial commitment schemes. How is the, then the IOP being um, um, with the communication being being uh, coded? Um, there are then uh, libraries where you find specific circuits that you can prove. Um, and there is also this resource on the zero knowledge MOOC, which is a YouTube course that is uh, really great if you want to uh, dive deeper in the in the topics and the building blocks I've just mentioned. Uh, so, so please uh, do that. That's a great resource. And yeah, that's it from my side. I'm happy to take maybe a couple of questions, one or two, and then, yeah, thanks for the attention.